talking about courage this morning. And really, you've taken great courage to stand for Jesus. And I pray our country, uh, believers all around. I don't know about you, but I believe there's an army, an invisible army right now, but there's an army in this land that could take this country back in Jesus' name if only they would stand. Amen or oh my. And there really is. Uh, I believe we're starting to see some movement, so I've decided to start a series of sermons called Fearless. Fearless. And uh, we're going to be looking at courage this morning and uh, going to be taking a look at the life of Moses. And so a brand new series, Great Stories of the Bible. We're going to be looking at Bible characters, their particular stories, most of them from the Old Testament, but some from the New. And these are real people. Um, when you read a character, read about a character in the Bible, you're not reading about some fictional character. You're reading about someone whom God used in their time. It was all in God's time, but it, he picked their generation. And I believe God is looking for people like you and I today to have courage, to be fearless with the Lord at our side. They subdued kingdoms. They destroyed enemies, enemies of the Lord, because they were fearless in the face of anything and everything that they faced. Fear is a bondage, and fear is a bondage that holds many today. Uh, many of our young people who go to the universities, there's fear of standing for Christ because of the disgrace that this culture can put on a person. There are many employees who are fearful because of the laws that have been changed that they might lose their job. There are people who are fear living in fear today. I want to tell you, our own system of government exchanged fear for freedom a couple of years ago. And they begin to rip away the freedoms. And rather than a revival of standing, a, a revival of people, it seems like we have just progressed to this place. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, one man cannot change this. Uh, <laughs> one movement cannot change this. What will change this are God's people living not in fear, but living inflamed by the Holy Spirit of God to take a stand for what is right. Now, I want to tell you, as I look at the Lord Jesus, Jesus, and that's how we'll conclude these messages, is looking at him. Um, I'm so thankful that he did not believe the cost was too high what it cost him to go to the cross. And so we're going to start this series of sermons. I want to tell you, biblically, fear is something that the Bible tells us is a bondage. Um, fear is a bondage, and we all feel it from time to time. It's like a prison. It will cage you. It will lock you up like a tyrant, and it will refuse to let you go. It will destroy your strength, and it will rob you of your joy. We started a series of sermons in the book of Philippians about having joy, and it's, it's just amazing to me how the Apostle Paul was sitting in a dungeon when he writes to us, and he writes to us that wonderful book to the church at Philippi, and, and there are many there are many refrigerator verses in that scripture. Um, one of my favorites is the God who began the good work in you. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, every time I think of you, I pray for you. And he had a joy. And yet, look at what he had in his future, potentially. He did not know what his future was. Neither do any of us. But nevertheless, the Apostle Paul fearlessly served the Lord. And God's calling people today in the same way. Fear is a, a bondage. According to Scripture, it can be a bondage of your emotions. It can, it can enslave you spiritually. It will lock you up, literally. 
Uh, many people today are held captive by anxious thoughts and worried minds. Prescriptions are at an all-time high for anxiety. I want to tell you, I believe the Lord Jesus can cure anxiety. I really do. When the Bible tells me in so many places to be still and know that he is God. To rest in the arms of the Lord Jesus. And so, can you imagine this life? Someone today is saying, you know, I don't know if it's possible to live a life free from that th the bondage of fear. Fear visits us all from time to time. But like a bird flying over my head, I can't stop that. But I can't stop him from building a nest in my hair. And so fear visits sometimes. It, it, it comes around. But we don't have to allow it to stay. In Jesus' name, you can say, get behind me, Satan. And it is possible to live a life apart from fear. Can you imagine those who are afraid? Can you imagine a life of peace? And a life of literally uh, just calm rather than chaos. Multiple times, 365 times, one for every day of the year, the Bible tells me, do not fear. Do not fear. God knows our potential towards fear, and so his promise is that he is able to break the chain. And so I want to start this morning with the life of Moses. I can't stand up here and use my own life as an example. I wish I could. I'm learning just like you. I'm learning like you. I grew up in this generation just like you. I'm part of this, th this part of time just like the rest of you. And I do believe with all of my heart we will all give an account to the Lord Jesus for how we spent our time, how we spent our lives, and how we used our lives, whether it was for his glory or for the world. And I believe that with all of my heart. So I want to start with Moses. Moses was a man among men. This is uh, the one who grew up in Egypt, adopted as the son of Pharaoh. He was a Jewish boy, a Hebrew, but he was adopted into the family of Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt, the most powerful man on earth. And yet at a certain time in his life, Moses made a courageous decision. Now some would call this, the biggest failure in his life, the biggest failure in his life, and it was failure in some sense. He took his eyes possibly off of the Lord for a moment, and he, and he committed a crime. But yet God used the courage in Moses to make a decision, not only for his own life, but for the people of Almighty God. And I, I, I want to show you how God used this. I love this chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 24, and this sums it up, if you will, for the life of Moses. I don't know what you think about Moses, but there's more Bible stories about Moses, possibly more than any other man in the Bible except the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses has more commentary from Scripture. And so here's this man. He's the first one I want to talk to. This is a man, dear sir, this is a man, dear madam, that we ought to look up to. Moses. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, by faith, Moses. Turn to your neighbor and say, faith, that's where it starts. Fear is conquered by faith. And it's by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, I would say so, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Notice this, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Now Moses was adopted. Too many people today say, Preacher, it'll never happen because we have it too good. Well, I want to tell you, Moses had it good. But he saw God's people who were suffering. And he identified with those people. And the Bible says it was by faith, Moses chose this. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for 
for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. That's a long way around of saying Moses made the right choice. And God said, well done. And the Bible's telling us that Moses, the life of Moses, it's a fascinating study. God was with Moses. God trusted Moses. Moses trusted God. God delivered Moses. He gave him the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, these, these, these first five books of the Bible, Moses, is, it, it's his hand that God uses to write these books. And so his life is a life of faith. Now, it starts off by faith, Moses, when he come to years, he made that decision. Look at chapter 11, verse 6. And let's talk about faith for just a moment. Moses' life is, a, is an example of faith. And the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God, apart from faith. If I were to ask you about your faith this morning, where was your faith? Is your faith in government? Is your faith in your checkbook? Is your faith in what you have accomplished? Is your faith in anything other than Jesus Christ? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Moses had a life that was characterized by faith. The faith ran all the way back to his birth. You remember the story we studied by by faith, uh, at great personal risk, Moses' mama disobeyed Pharaoh's decree that all Hebrew males were to be killed at birth. And so he survived because he was sustained by the mighty hand of providence. He was released to the Nile by the faith of his mother. He was found floating in an ark of bulrushes. And he was adopted by the providence of God by Pharaoh's daughter. And I want to tell you what just coincidence that she was there at the right time. God's hand was in it. Amen. When you and I place our faith in God, you can trust that you are working and, and you can expect God's hand to be working in your life. God rewards. He diligently rewards those people of faith. Moses had faith that went started at his birth and under Pharaoh's roof it continues on someone uh, says uh, some of the elite today say that environment has so much to do with a child's education to what a child becomes and I'm sure it has its influence and it will but I want to tell you nothing can influence a child more than Jesus Christ when God's hand is active in a family, when, when, when God's providence is at work. I remember uh, the time when mamas read Bible stories to their children. I remember the time when children would see their mamas and their daddies reading scripture and praying and asking God to, to deliver them through whatever crisis was going on. Children today growing up, and we talk about the environment. Well, I want to tell you, Moses had an environment. But at some point, Moses became conscious of what was more important. God did not allow Moses to identify with the Egyptians, but rather Moses identified with the slaves. Even though he's rooted and raised, in the Pharaoh's house, he identifies with the slaves. And one day he sees an Egyptian beating a slave. And it's more than he can take. And this might be a failure in his life, and it, and it was. But something stirred within him. He had deep sorrow for the Hebrew who was being beaten. And he rushed to the defense of the slave, killing the Egyptian. And this was more than a fit of rage, but... Rather, Moses made a premeditated choice that he would identify with the people of God. When Moses buried that man, and that's what he did, he tried to cover his sin, and sin covered never lasts, amen, it always comes uncovered. 
And when he buried that Egyptian's body in the sands of Egypt, he buried his own promising future in the house of Pharaoh. The Bible says Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh. He dwelt in the land of Midian. Now, when you come to the third chapter of the book of Exodus, and that's where we'll be for this point on, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 3. Moses is now 80 years old. He's 80 years old. Now, how many in the room are 80 and above? There we go. We got some. God's not finished with you yet. That's my message to you. God's not finished with you yet. In Acts chapter 7, when he was a full 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptians. So there you go. Preacher, how would you know how old he was? The Bible tells me right there in the book of Acts. Moses was 40 when he killed the Egyptian. He flees. He runs. And in Acts chapter 7, and when 40 years were expired, this is verse 30, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. So the burning bush experience happened when he's 80. 40 plus 40 is 80. Now how did God prepare Moses the same way he prepares us? It wasn't in a day, that's for sure. He prepared him over time. 40 years on the backside of the desert. That's, it, it's one of my favorite parts of Moses' life. Most of us are rural people. We like living on the backside of Hono. I mean, uh, of, 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 of the desert, right? Yeah, that's supposed to be a joke, but. <laughs> God prepares us not in a moment, not in an event, but he prepares us through a process. And more important than the goal that God is up to, the goal that he wants us to get to, just as important is the journey, what's happening while we're waiting. Waiting is what deepens, and it's in this waiting room of life that God begins to do his wonderful work, and there are no coincidences. God knows how to level us. God, God knows how to get us right where he wants us to be, to level our perspective, to broaden our understanding. Noah waited 120 years before the rains came. Abraham waited 25 years for the promised son, Isaac. Joseph waited 14 years in a prison for a crime that he never committed. God was working in his life. And right now, many people are discouraged. And I, I want to tell you, perhaps, perhaps, no one knows the future, but what if God is still at work in this great country? Job waited perhaps a lifetime for God's justice. Moses knew what it was like to go from a prince to a pauper. At 40 years old, he made a mistake, and then that decision would change the next 40 years of his life. He would spend them on the backside of the desert in Midian, in, in, in Midian. and by the time he's 80, you can imagine he settled in pretty good. And one day, out there with the sheep, there's a bush with a fire that would not go out. He was in Horeb, and Horeb means desert, literally the backside. So the Bible refers to this, and before Exodus, before the Exodus from Egypt, the Bible refers to this very mountain as Horeb. After the Exodus, guess what this mountain is called? You know, when God goes to work and he chooses a piece of real estate, it's serious business. When Moses stood on Horeb and God said, take your shoes off, it's holy ground, you know where he was standing? He was standing on Mount Sinai. Moses is about to have the encounter of his life, and I, I challenge you, he, he, he doesn't even realize himself all that's about to take place. And so God gives him these commandments, this law of God. And so that's the background to Moses. That's, that, that's where we get to get to his life. The first thing I want to look at is, is how God prepared him, the preparation of Moses. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, 
Exodus 3, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Some of God's greatest work is accomplished in the rural areas of life. Amen? Everyone thinks, uh, I, I don't know, someone told me one time they love to talk about that mansion that Jesus has for them in glory. And, and I suppose God has mansions. Uh, uh, there are some people who might think of heaven as a mansion on Fifth Avenue. I think of heaven as a cabin in the corner Amen. somewhere. Um, just, just give me the backside. And uh, Moses was on the backside of the desert, and for 40 years he's there. And outwardly there were many changes. Think about what God had accomplished in Moses' life in that 40 years. From the house of Pharaoh, now gone in Moses was the refinement, the eloquence, and the dignity that he was taught in Egypt. God now has worked in a far different way. Now there's a common man. Uh, probably many would say a crude man. Would you agree? Remember the Christmas story of the shepherds who kept, who kept the sheep? They were not... Um, it, in the city, they weren't the most welcomed of people. They smelled, number one. Uh, they were common people. They were poor people, if you will. His clothes were poor. His clothes were dirty. He lived the rough life of a shepherd. And for 40 years, by himself, he and the Lord, with his father-in-law and what family they had, here's a man who once had words with an opinion, and now you probably could barely get him to say a few things. Once a man in Egypt, with everything going for him, and now probably had very little to say. The overconfidence of privilege is gone. The overconfidence of royalty is gone. It's all now replaced with uncertainty and hardship. The life of a shepherd, the years of the desert, have left their mark. And the ambition and enthusiasm of youth is far gone. Inwardly, there's changes. In the desert, as he spent time alone, he had time to learn more about himself than he ever knew. Have you ever noticed it's in the still and quiet times of life that God is able to get our attention and God shows us more about ourselves? He discovered himself as a sinner. He realized he had sinned. He had many time, uh, much time to spend talking to the Lord. How foolish he was to ever think he could go at it alone. When he took his eyes off the Lord, that's when he made his greatest mistake. If you'd asked Moses at this time, he probably would have said the desert was his punishment. But little did he know that God was still at work and God was preparing Moses even though he was on the backside. Moses couldn't see it, but it was the years in the desert that became probably the most important years of his life where God prepared him. Now, that's the preparation. I want you to see the response when God shows up. In verse 2 of Exodus 3, uh, we're going to read 2 through 5. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Can you imagine that? I, that? That would get my attention. I'm out there, and there's a fire that don't go out. I want to go take a look, and when he... When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, that's significant. I believe God would have let him walk on by. But Moses knew something was up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. And he said, Moses, Moses. And he answered, Here I am. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou stand is holy ground. What's interesting is about this, number one, as I mentioned, Moses, what if he would have walked by? Verse 4 says it's when the Lord saw him turn. Um, 
I kind of find that odd. If I saw this bush burning, there's not a chance that I would walk by. I'm going to go take a look at it. And so what's the point of God putting that in our Bible? It was when Moses turned. I believe some people are so busy in this life, God could show up in whatever way it is, and they never have time for God. Are you too busy? Are you too consumed? Moses was still in a place where God could get his attention. Someone once said it like this, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And I look around our country, and I see, I see people running like there's no tomorrow. I don't know how the family has done. I mean, the family's in bad shape, but I don't know how we even got families left at the rate we're going. There's no time for family anymore. Many times at church, I, I literally counsel people. You know, uh, we have a lot of activities here at church, and as a pastor, I try to make all of them, and that's my job. But I want to tell you, if you try to be here every time we got something going on and you got young children at home, you're putting your family on the altar. Your first and foremost duty, Mom, is to mother your children. Dad is, is to be the father of your children. And so we have people ha more committed to softball, baseball, or soccer than they are the Lord Jesus. And they're running, and they're running, and they're running, and we wonder what's going on. Can I get a witness? Moses, at least on the back side, God had gotten his attention, and when God needed to talk to him, Moses was available. It's the only reason I believe it's in there. I see the Lord working in many ways today. And I see very few people responding. I've said this many, many times. One of the biggest lies in our land is this thing called climate change. Now I realize we just came through a very hot period. Some say it's, it's possibly been the hottest. I don't know. Bud was out in Las Vegas, said it was 115 degrees, 103 at 6 o'clock in the morning. But I want to tell you something about this. What that is telling us, if you believe that, that people have control of this earth. That we can control it, whether it's destroyed or whether it's kept. And I want to tell you, only God has that. Amen. Only God. And God is the one. He's given us much scripture to show us that he's not finished with this earth yet. There is still literally a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ going to happen upon this earth. This earth. And so I know to trust the Lord. And Moses is trusting God. He says, I'm going to turn aside. I'm going to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt out. And God reveals himself to Moses. And I want to tell you, Moses was afraid at the first. Many sermons have been preached about God's call to Moses was to go get his people, and Moses says, I can't. I, I don't talk well enough. And God had to encourage him. God had to show him. Um, Moses begins to respond to the Lord, and the Bible gives us all of that story about how Moses was used by God. One of my favorite parts is the rod, which God tells him, uh, what's that in your hand? Ask him, what's that in your hand? It's, it's a staff. It's a shepherd's staff. God says, throw it down. What happened to it? Yeah. And then God told him to pick it up. <laughs> huh. Amen? Yeah. Uh, God's working to build him by faith. And one of the biggest parts of the whole story, Moses says, who do I tell the people that sent me? And God says, tell them I am. I am. 
Folks, I want to tell you, God is not finished with us. And this is far from over. And the part that bothers me the most about our generation is as I look at all these heroes of the faith, they sacrificed much to follow Jesus. Amen? To follow God. Sometimes we act like we're the only ones that sacrifice anything. They sacrifice much. And the Bible gives us their story. And I don't even have to stop at the scriptures. I can just go to history and look at history. How many soldiers have sacrificed for the freedom of our country? How many sailors? How many, how many common people? called by God, or they, they have given it all, and yet today we have people who are reserved because it's going to cost too much. So we see the preparation of Moses. We see uh, the call of Moses. Look at, look at verse 6. He said, when Moses asked who he was, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. And the God of Jacob and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God's not unaware. He knows the sorrow. I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large un unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, in essence, God's not finished. God's plan is not finished. God's story is not finished. Well, dear friend, it's time for me to close this, but I, I want to close on the same note. God's not finished. And he's still at work. And God is looking to this generation, how many will, by faith, have the courage to trust God, to look to the Lord and not look to this world? I want to tell you, as I read uh, stories about the things, the, uh, the abominations that are happening in our land, I'm surprised. I I remember a time when the anger of the Lord would burn in the people of the Lord when abominations such as what we see in our land go, go on. I, it, it just amazes me. When children are being abused, when uh, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people is, taking, is hijacked. And freedoms are being destroyed. I want to tell you, God is not finished with us. Now, um, I'm a military guy, only four years. But more than that, I'm the son of a military guy. I was raised in a military home. My daddy was career Air Force. And I want to tell you, we were taught as children to love our country. We were taught as children that there are sacrifices to be made for a country. I was raised in such a way that in my wildest dreams, I would never imagine what I see today. I would never have imagined that. But yet as a pastor, as we all stand, and as the musicians will come and we all stand before the Lord, as a pastor, let me say this. After saying all of that, I want to tell you about my God. My God is able to accomplish anything that he chooses to accomplish. Now, I don't know what's going to happen to our country, but uh, I'll tell you this. I know what's going to happen to me. Because I have made the decision that I will follow Jesus Christ no matter what the cost. How about you? Um, this, this war will not be won 
by trusting in one movement or one man, but rather when ordinary people decide to trust in one person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And he can turn this around. God help us all. Father, we come to you today. We pray, Lord, that you would send revival to this land. We pray, Lord, as we study these heroes, that you would raise up Gideons, and you would raise up Esthers, and you would raise up people like Moses who are willing to take a stand, willing to fight the good fight, to run the course and finish the race. And, Father, we pray that you would send this revival, not for our sakes, but for your name's sake. Lord, for your glory, for your purpose. And, Lord Jesus, that you would accomplish this, and we give you all the praise and all the credit for it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Perhaps you're here this morning and you say, Preacher, I want to I wanna be part of that. I want Jesus to have my heart. I want to follow him. I want to take a stand. I want to have the courage. I don't want to live under fear anymore. I want to be courageous. Maybe you want to come pray at the altar. Uh, you come as we sing this song of invitation. You come if you need the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross. Sometimes you get a little discouraged, and sometimes you wonder what the Lord is up to in our lives. Yep, you come on and sit right here, because we got something for you. We sure do. And it's good. Yeah. Um, but God's been working in our church for some time, and I've been asking the question, Lord, what are you up to? What are you calling us to do? As I see the church grow... Ladies and gentlemen, we're not growing just to, for the sake of growth. We're growing because God is about to accomplish something through us. He, he's guiding. He's providing. He, so I challenge you to find your place, to find your ministry, and, and to plug into it. It's only then that we can accomplish what he's called us to do. There's a lot of work to be done. And here's some more people he sent to us from Texas. If God sent you here from Texas, raise your hand. Or maybe y'all about to get taken up. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying. I, I, I didn't do this. God did. But Dana and Dave Lipscomb have sold their property. God helped them delivered it, it sold, they're done, and they're coming to Co First Baptist Church, coming by letter, yeah. coming by letter from First Baptist Church, Moore's Lane, have you ever seen the size of that church? That thing is big, Tommy yeah. called it the uh, Power Ranger station or something, yeah. whenever he went by there, he called it the Power Ranger, but anyway, Dave, you and Dana, would you come and just Turn around right here because they're going to come give you a right hand of fellowship here in a minute. They're going to be nice to Dana. They're going to get kind of rough on Dave. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. So, God bless you. God bless you. We welcome you. All those in favor, say amen. Amen. All right. Rita, you stand because I got something for you. I got the Bible, which is the Word of God. There's the box. 
This certificate says, Rita Stewart, on August 8th, 2023, I followed the Lord in believer's baptism, and I need to sign that, so don't let me get by with that. But also, this Bible is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path, and we give you this, and come by, and I'll get that signed. But y'all give her a big hand. Yeah. So before, before you leave, you come around here, and you hug these two, and you work that one over over there. No, 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 I'm just kidding. Work them over in Jesus' name. You know? so, anyway, Brother Terry Scott, close us, please.